Exodus chapter number 15. I want to begin reading tonight in verse number 22. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. The Bible says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. But therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance. There he proved them. Verse 26 says, And they said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought, brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. I want to preach. I, I'm, Sunday I preached about our valleys, and how the valleys, many times, they're personal valleys. I preached on the ministry of the valley. Tonight, the Lord be my helper, I want to preach on the ministry of moving forward. The ministry of moving on. Moving forward. When it comes to the Christian life, I do believe you'll agree with me that from the moment that you and I are saved to the very day when we go home to be with the Lord, that the life of every born-again believer is a life of growth and development and maturing daily in our walk of faith. Just simply put, the Christian life is a life of progression. I mean, we wasn't always where we are right now. I mean, we had to grow in the grace and the knowledge. We had to progress in grace and in knowledge. With that said, I want you to notice with me, you don't have to turn down, I'm going to read it to you. In chapter 14 and verse 15 of the book of Exodus, the Bible says... And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. And we know that they did indeed go forward. Matter of fact, the Bible says that the Lord led them. And Brother Jordan and I was talking about this coming from the airport the other morning. He, were, they, he led them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And may I say the children of Israel were obedient to follow wherever God led them. The Bible does say obedience is, is better than sacrifice. It's always good to obey the Lord and follow Him. Now what so amazes me about all of this is the places where God led the children of Israel. And the lesson that you and I can learn from their experience. I want you to notice with me tonight the first place God led them was by the way of the Red Sea. After they came out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, God led them by the way of the Red Sea. The Bible says in Exodus 13, verse 18, that God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed, out of the land of Egypt. And of course, we know the story of how God used Moses to bring his people out of bondage there in the land of Egypt, which, by the way, is a picture of salvation. But when they arrived at the Red Sea in chapter 15, all they could see was trouble. Here the Red Sea was before them. Pharaoh was behind them. They had mountains on each side of them, and they literally thought that Moses had led them out of Egypt just simply for them to die. But I, may I remind you tonight, they were at the Red Sea because God led them there. God took them to that place. And if you forget everything I've said tonight, please just simply remember this. If God leads you to a place of trouble, if He leads you to a place of heartache and despair and, and anxiety in your life, always remember this. He's big enough and strong enough and He's God enough to see you through. Amen. 
Simply put, if he leads you to it, he'll see you through it. Can I get an amen right there? But watch this. Even though they had witnessed a great victory at the hand of God, they had to move on. You know the story how God took them over to the Red Sea. Verse 22 of chapter 15 says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out. I'll be honest with you, church. We can't live our life focused on past victories in our life. But what a great victory it was for all, see all those millions of Jews come out of the land of Egypt, out of that place of bondage. But we find tonight they had to keep pressing on. Same thing stands for you and I tonight. It's true. We got to keep pressing on in our life. Boy, I enjoy the victories of God, don't you? I enjoy, praise God, when God helps me in a trying time and helps me through a troubled time. But even when it's that way... Still just got to keep going forward. We got to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. We see here he led them by the way of the Red Sea. And then secondly, we find tonight that he brought them to the wilderness of Shur. That word Shur simply means a wall. Now here we go. He brought them from an extreme high they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. I mean, God took them all over. And, and here they are on the other side rejoicing. And, and I mean, in a time of, of camp meeting atmosphere, Brother Doug, I mean, they were excited about how God had brought them over the Red Sea and brought them out of the land of bondage. Here they go from an extreme high now to an extreme low. One minute again, they're in the camp meeting Fear the next minute we find they're no longer shouting, they hit a wall. Well, I don't know about you tonight, but it seems like that's how most of my Christian life has been. One minute I'm on the mountain, the next minute I'm in the valley. That's why I know a little bit about the valleys that I preached about yesterday morning because I've spent a lot of time in the valley. I don't know about you, but that's the way it's been with me. May I remind you, though, the wilderness tonight is a dry place. It can be a hard place. The Bible says in verse 22 that they were three days in the wilderness and they found no water. I mean, can you imagine? They're thirsty. They're tired. They're give out. They're beaten from the journey. I'll go ahead and tell you tonight, church, a lot of times we get in that same kind of condition. We get worn out. We get defeated. We get down and out. We feel dry on the inside because of the journey. As Brother uh, Greg said last night, we shouldn't get weary in the way. We might get weary of the way, but we never get weary in the way. They knew that they were facing a critical time in their life. But what do you do when you're facing a critical time in your life? What do you do when you're facing a a time of calamity in your life, a wilderness time down in the valley, spiritually speaking. You do exactly what the children of Israel did. You press on. You keep pressing forward. <laughs> when all is good and all is bad, keep pressing on. When, all, when you're on the mountain, when you're in the valley, when you're down and out and you're discouraged, you keep pressing on. You can't bog down in it. If you get bogged down in it, I promise you tonight, ma'am, sir, it will consume you. It will overwhelm you and overtake you. You say, preacher, how do you do that? A lot of times you just got to do what David did. You got to encourage yourself in the Lord. You got to get along with God. And you got to say, Lord, you know what kind of shape I'm in. You know where I'm at in my walk as a believer. You know what I've been going through in my life. And Lord, I need you to give me that strength. I need you to give me that power. I need you to give me that might. Lord, to just keep pressing on. I had to get away with God, get along with God. Oh, it's good to have friends that encourage you. And I'm all for that. It's good for people to, to try to help you along the way, but at some point in time in your life, if you stay in this thing long enough, you'll find out that sometimes all you can do is cry, Oh God, oh God, help me. Oh God, help me. I'm in a mess, Lord. I'm in a place, God, it's a dry place. It's a hard place. Lord, I'm in the midst of the wilderness in my life, and I need you to...
touch me, God. And I promise you he'll do it. As wonderful as the Red Sea experience was, Brother Jordan, they couldn't relish it. They couldn't stay there. They had to keep pressing on. As devastating as the wilderness of Shur was, they couldn't bog down, Brother Ray. They had to keep pressing on. Boy, I tell you what, that's when you really need God. I mean when you're in the wilderness of life. Now watch this. We see here tonight not only the way of the Red Sea and the wilderness of Shur, but notice the third place that we find they come to is what we what the Bible calls Mara. The waters of Mara. Look again at verse 23. It said, When they come to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Now think about it. They'd been in the wilderness for quite some time. They're weary, they're tired, they're worn out from the journey. And all of a sudden, they hear a cry in the camp. There's water ahead. Water up ahead. Boy, and they get all excited. Brother Peter, they get, over, they get all consumed in knowing that now, boy, their thirst was going to get quenched. Only to find out when they began to take a drink of the water, the water was bitter. Boy, that not, hey, that knocked the wind out of your sails, wouldn't it? I mean, praise God, that kind of put you asunder, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, but what do you got to do, preacher? You got to do what they did. You got to keep pressing on. You got to keep going forward. When the children of Israel arrived at the bitter waters of Marah, I thought about this. There's, there's certain things in life that happen to us. There's certain situations that you and I come to in our life that they're there to teach us what I refer to as being life lessons. Say, preacher, what are they? Well, when the children of Israel arrived at the bitter waters of Marah, they learned that life has a mixture. Mine and your life has a mixture. It's a mixture of the good and the bad. Again, they just come out of a great victory of their crossing the Red Sea only to face defeat. Hey, the Bible does tell you and I in this day that we're living that all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall what? Suffer persecution. Job said it so well. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. I tell you where our resting place is. It's over there in Canaan's fair land. It's praise God when we breathe this last breath and it's good night down here and it's just good morning over there. Yes. I tell you right now, praise God, I don't have a lick of dying grace. I got a lot of living grace right now. And I tell you, I enjoy living grace and I know when the time comes for me to check out and go home to be with Jesus, I'm going to relish in that dying grace. But until then, I'm going to keep pressing on. I got to. Why, preacher? Because he's been better to me than I deserve. I tell you, they learned something about life, and it'd do us well to learn as well. Life is a mixture. A mixture of the good and the bad. A mixture of the mountains and the valleys. I wish I could tell you life was like this, but it's not. If you look at a monitor on a heart machine, if you've ever been in, in a hospital room and somebody's hooked up, that monitor goes, so like Brother Greg said last night, life's just like that. It's up and down, up and down. Up and down, up and down. One good day, one bad day. One happy time, one sad time. One day of sorrow, one day of suffering. But you know what? The good times far outweigh the bad. I tell you, I look back over my life and I'm so glad I didn't get bogged down. I'm glad I didn't throw the towel in. I'm glad, praise God, when I didn't have an ounce of energy left in me spiritually, that there he come, like I said, had leaping over the mountains and skipping over the hills and sat right smack down in the middle of my heartache in my valley. They learned something about life. Life has a mixture. Something else we find, they learned that life has a master. See, it was the same God that led them out of the, the land of Egypt. It was the same God that took them through the bitter waters. Hey, it was the same God that it allowed them to enjoy the singing and the shouting on the other side of the Red Sea. God hadn't changed, friend. 
Hey, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm glad, praise God, that the Lord is, is mine and your hope, mine and your strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Hey, it's not my joy. I go ahead and tell you, if it's my joy, I'd be in a mess. I'm glad the joy of the Lord, our joy is in Him. If I look within myself, you know what I'll do? I'll give up. I'll throw in the towel. I quit. But you know what? Deep down inside of my soul, there's the Holy Ghost. And every now and again, praise God, when I feel like quitting, when I feel like throwing in the towel, and don't think we preachers don't get that way. See, y'all, can I preach to y'all a minute? You see, y'all not the only one get the feeling that way. We get the feeling that way sometimes. You know what keeps us going, Brother Christian? It's the Holy Ghost. Boy. Holy Ghost, breathe. Breathes in us every once in a while. I mean, stands up and turns over a tub of honey in the gable end of our soul. And that's what keeps us keeping on. That's what keeps you going in the day of adversity. That's what keeps you going in troubled times and in trying times, in pandemic times, praise God. They learn that life is a mixture. Life has a master. But they also learn that life has a ministry. See, one thing I miss, God ministers to you. Oh, listen, when you, I'm talking about in the good days and in the bad days. God's always right there for you. All you got to do is recognize Him. Holy Ghost, inside, somebody as big as God can't move in, and you not know He's there. That's what troubled Christian for so long. He was singing about a God he knew nothing about. Hey, there's a lot of people in our church of the day do the same thing. They'll sing about a God they know nothing about. They'll testify about a Jesus that they hadn't met yet. I'm going to tell you right now, if you can, I'm boy, I'm back on this Calvary. If you can't go back to that place in your life where you met Jesus at the cross of Calvary and you put your trust in Him, then you need to hit this altar tonight. You need to get saved. You need to get born again. Hey, listen. You may not ever remember the time. You may not remember the month. You may not remember the year. But if you're saved tonight, you remember the place where you met him. I guarantee you these children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, boy, they knew it was God that brought them out. I tell you what, when I came out of my Egypt on that Wednesday night, I knew it was Jesus that brought me out, Brother Michael. I knew it was the Lord of glory that I had met and He changed my life. Listen, the Red Sea we know tonight represents deliverance. They crossed it. We know the wilderness of Sher tonight represents difficulty. So if we, gotta, if we come to that conclusion, we also got to arrive at the conclusion that Mara, there the water's bitter. Mara has to represent disappointment. I want to ask you, have you ever been disappointed? Come on now. Have, has life ever disappointed you? Has people ever disappointed you? Has your friends, your family ever disappointed you? Has life you felt like ever let you down? Well, without a doubt, I believe we've all had moral experiences in life. I believe that. We've been hurt. We've been done wrong. I be honest with you, we have let ourselves down. We've let others down. Others have let us down. And listen, I'll be honest with you, for the last 41 years I've been saved and preaching for 30 years, I can honestly say that my greatest battle has been the bitter waters of mom. See, I could look back over my life now if I wanted to, and I could pull out my fiddle. Where's that fiddle? I could get my fiddle out and start playing my sad song up under my juniper tree. Sure I could. You could too if you'd be honest about it. But I'll be honest with you tonight. You really don't have a sad song to sing. I mean, I'm just, hey, I'm not going to hell. <laughs> hey, what? I mean, why are we going to sing sad songs? 
I mean, we're just not going to hell, amen. We're going to go get to see Jesus. Hey, just like the sister sung, I'm all for the mansions and I'm looking for some loved ones that's going on before me. But hey, they take a back seat. Oh, they take a back seat to seeing the one who is all together lovely. The one that shed his blood and gave his life on Calvary's tree. Hey, he's the reason that we keep on keeping on and trying to. Lord, have mercy. I want to show you something. Look with me in verse 32. Or verse 23, excuse me. The Bible says again, when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Look at verse 24. People murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. Look what the Lord showed him. The Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast it into the waters the Bible says the waters were made sweet. You see God used that bitter water to teach him a life lesson. And notice here, look again, verse 25, what happens? He cast that water. He cast that tree, showed him the tree, and he cast it into the water, and the waters were made sweet. Now, y'all probably know this, so act like you don't, okay? Y'all probably already know it. So if you do, just, you know, wing it. Act like you don't. But did you know, long before, the children of Israel ever got to those bitter waters. Somebody, the Lord of glory, had dropped a seed in the ground to grow that tree. See, they wasn't, the waters were bitter before they got there. God dropped that seed in the ground there, grew that tree before they ever got there. What a sovereign God. God of providence. See, he already knew, oh, this is really, it, it, it blows my little pea sides brain. I'm not near as educated as most of y'all are. But it blows my little brain to think about a God before he ever plugged the mud seals and this old ball of clay we call earth already made preparation for them children of Israel come out of Hey, don't you think if he hadn't already made, he made preparation for them, don't you think he's made preparation for you? Yeah, right. yeah. And for me? Yeah, yeah. When we reach those bitter waters in our life? Yeah. Sure he has. Now I'm going to give you something real quick. I'm going to hurry through this. I don't know. I may not hurry through it. I thought about our life, and you'll all agree, our life is full of bitter times. More than we care to admit. See, sometimes we just keep it to ourselves. We don't tell anybody. Because you see, <laughs> oh, it was already said today, we got, we're good at masking things. I tell you what, if Hollywood ever needed it, did I say Hollywood? I meant say Hollywood. If Hollywood ever needed any actors, I know Baptist churches slam full of some of the best actors that you can possibly find. We put a smile on our face. We get a spring in our... I bet honest with you, sometimes I sit on this pew and shout, and I don't have no shout in me, but I shout it anyhow. I was shouting on credit. I've raised that hand on credit. See, we some of the best actors a lot of times that you'll find. Because, see, our life is full of burdens. So you say, preacher, what? And I'll tell you something about burdens. Burdens will weight you down, preacher. Burdens will harness you. I hadn't really studied that verse out. It said they came out of the land of Egypt harnessed. I hadn't really studied. Jordan, you probably can educate me on it, but just stay with me on this one. They probably had some burdens on their life in their life, even when they came out of the land of Egypt. Because when I think about harness, I think about something that kind of keeps me constricted. I think about something that keeps me bound. I'm going to tell you what you can do with the burdens of your life, with those things that keep you back. I thought about 
There's three types of burdens that bind us in life. And what can we do? See, because if we'll get rid of them, if we'll shed them, if we'll take care of it, we can keep moving forward. Now watch this. I thought about, first of all, failures. What do you do when past failures start bothering you? How do you get... See, there's some burdens you just shed. Some burdens you share. And some burdens you just simply got a shoulder. So what do you do with them? Well, those burdens of failure. I thought about failures in life. You nail them to the cross. Because you see, we'd be honest, we all sin and come short of the glory of God every day of our life. Aren't you glad for 1 John 1 and 9? It says if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, I'm so glad that verse is there. Hey, I live in that verse a lot of times. I say, Lord, help me for thinking that thought. Lord, help me for acting that way. Lord, help me for saying what I shouldn't have said and acted like I shouldn't have and did what I shouldn't have done. Oh, come on now. Put your halo up under your pew. You know I'm right. Failures, you just simply take your failures and you nail them to the cross. Hey, the songwriter had it right. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. If you're here tonight, you're bound in your sin, I highly recommend the Christ of Calvary. Go to Him. Run to Him. You know what He'll do? He'll change your life. You say, preacher, will I act like you? I sure hope not. My wife, I heard her. She's watching. She said, amen right there. We see failures. We nail them to the cross. But there's another pressure in life that we have to get relief from. And that is the, the, the time when we get fatigued in life. Have you ever been fatigued? Failures, you nail them to the cross. You know what you do when you get fatigued? You go to church. Wonder where everybody's at tonight. I mean, we got a good crowd here, don't misunderstand me. Good number. But I see a few empty places where I didn't know they may have legitimate reasons. Now I know that I'm not I'm not I'm not mean. I know that. They may have may be work may have but just wonder if some laid out thought we'd watch it on Facebook or YouTube. I tell you, you'll never get on YouTube and Facebook what you can get right here. Oh, you can watch it, but it's not like being here. I mean, you can, hey, you can't feel the presence of the Holy Ghost and feel the move of God at home like you can right here. But when you get fatigued, don't stay away from church. Come to the house of God. And you find solace in the Word of God. You find solace in the preaching. You find help and strength when God's man stands up and preaches the Word of God. When the choir sings and the special songs, when everybody's in tune one with another, you get help in the house of God. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. You say, what day, preacher? That day when the Lord Himself yeah. shall ascend from heaven with a shout yeah. and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God yeah. and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds and to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort you one another yeah. with these words. Yeah. Those sins, those failures in life, we nail them to the cross. That fatigue you just take, you go to church. Aren't you glad for the house of God? Aren't you glad for a man of God tonight? Let us stand and preach the truth to you. Oh, and preach it in love and preach it in, in a care and attitude and concern for your souls. I'm going to tell you right now, these young people are here tonight because they got to hear preaching. <laughs> oh, what a pastor you got here. All right, I'm going to toot his horn a little bit. I love him. Oh, I remember, praise God, when we were in the old building. I guess that's what we call it. Don't it's fellowship Paul now. I remember, praise God, when they walked about 17 or 20 people here, and I look at you. I mean, ain't God good? You know what this church is built on? It's built on old-time preaching. 
Hey, if you're looking for an old-timey church that's built on preaching and old-time worship, I tell you right now, that charismatic crowd, they ain't got a thing on us. We was acting like this long before they ever come along. I'm glad you don't have no praise and worship team up here. I tell you what, you got enough of that mess. Call it rock and roll Christian music. Not so, not so, liar, liar, pants on fire. No such a thing as Christian rock. It's old timey gospel music. Old timey choir singing. Oh, I love it. I love it. And Brother James, I tell you, I was sitting there and I don't think Miss Sidney heard me. But I said, you know, if I could sing like that, I would. I love being able to take that, that microphone and lay my head back and lay into it. If it's a little bit higher tide right now, I might do it. might try it. Seriously. Failures. You nail them to the cross. Fatigue. You come to church. But what do you do with your flesh? <laughs> oh, I know y'all flesh is sanctified. You feel with the Holy Ghost. Yeah, you sanctified. Oh, I know we're full of the Holy Ghost. I mean, we got God, God got all we got all of Him. We'd ever get day we got saved. He just gets more of us. So what do we do with this old flesh? You gotta crucify him. Failures, you nail them to the cross. Fatigue, go to church. This old flesh, you gotta crucify. Galatians 2 and 20 said, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Oh Lord. You ever thought about this? Paul, and I always refer to him as the great apostle Paul. I believe he's one of the greatest men God ever saved. And by the way, I'm back on Calvary right quick. Every time Paul refers back to that Damascus Road experience, and he does it several times, he refers back to that place. Yep. So you'll never forget that place. Now, you might have been out in the cornfield. You might have been in a deer stand. You might have been in a ditch mowing grass. You might have been up here at this altar. You might have been at home, praise God, sitting on your couch or kneeling beside your bed, but you all remember that place. Now Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Give no place to this old flesh. This flesh should take you out. This flesh should take you out in the far country if you let it. And I'm talking about you can be sitting on a pew in a Bible-believing church and still be living in a far country in your life. You got crucified every day. You know, crucifixion is the only means of death that a man can't do to himself. You can't crucify yourself. Not in the physical realm. You think about it. I mean, if you want to do yourself in, there's a lot of ways, but one of them is not crucifixion. Come on now. You know I'm right about it. I just look dumb. I do study a little bit. I heard my wife again. I heard my daughter in the background. They said, Amen. Seriously. Can't crucify yourself. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Daily. Daily. You and I in this life have to look to Him. We got to lay our burdens down at His feet. We daily got to confess our sin. We got, I'm going to tell you what I've done one time. I don't recommend it, but it called really I, really, I really, I probably need to do it again. But one time, I asked the Lord to help me write down some sins that I had forgotten to, to confess I needed to get right and after I got done with two pages I stopped y'all ain't going to have me back are you Lord God he's that wicked he? after two pages I stopped you want to see revival get it under the blood see revival is for us saved people oh I believe people get saved in the midst of revival don't misunderstand me but the psalmist said wilt thou not revive us again O Lord 
and that thy people may rejoice in thee. Psalmist David was simply saying, Lord, you done it one time, I know you can do it again. Hey, hey revival is for us. And the only way we'll ever get revived, Brother Bob, Miss Sonny, is to get our sins under the blood, hey. to get those things in our heart and our mind and in our life that control us and consume us and overwhelm us and overtake us and say, Lord, I am what I am by your grace. And Lord, I want to move forward. I want to go forward. I want to move on in my Christian life. I want to move on in my walk with God and I promise you you will did you know that IBC is now on iTunes TuneIn, SoundCloud and Google Play head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today and as always thanks for listening